Hey everybody, thank you for watching our YouTube channel. I believe this message is going to be a powerful blessing in your life. And I'll be right back at the conclusion to pray for you. I want to start out with our foundation scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 5 to 10. But before I read it, I recognize that many of us have used the word church interchangeably over the years with buildings, groups, denominations, and have had different ideas of what the real, the, tr the true church is. But really understand that the church comes from the Greek word, the word church, ecclesia, which is the called out ones, called out of darkness into his marvelous light. In fact, we, we, there would be, have been no reason for us to be called out if we stayed in. Think about it, that in the garden, God had created us in His image and His likeness. And then Adam sold us out and then we were kicked out. <laughs> and then God had to call us back out and bring us back in. <laughs> don't you just love God? He don't leave you out there. So the church is called the called out ones, called out of, do of darkness into God's marvelous light. You'll see it encapsulated in that scripture. The church is not a building. The church is not a denomination. Come on, the church is a people. Come on, I said a people. As we sit here today, the church is also called the family of God. It's called the bride of Christ. There are many terms and I don't have time to go through it, uh, through all the names that God has given us as a church. But specifically because it's synonymous with our language today. Understand when God formed us in His image and in His likeness, He wanted us to be like Him. He said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and take dominion. God always wanted a people for himself. I mean, you know, right from the beginning, you'll see in the notes, God's a jealous God. Come on, he said, I will share my glory with nobody else. And that's why it was so tough on Adam and Eve, because God had given them an instruction to enjoy the blessing, to enjoy the favor, to stay in the glory, to be clothed with power and glory. And then Adam comes, and then Satan comes, uh, he beguiles Eve, uh, and we lose the glory, and hence man was put out of the presence of God. But thank God he doesn't leave us out there. And through the ages, from Genesis all the way through to Malachi, we see prophet, priests, kings, everybody that came along in one effort to restore us back to God. But nobody qualified. And thank God for Jesus. Come on, I said, thank God for Jesus. In fact, man sold us out, so we needed a man to redeem a man. So God became a man, humbled himself. Come on, to the death of the cross. But God did not just leave him there. He highly exalted him. Gave him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so essentially when Jesus comes, he redeems us back to God. He redeems us back to God. In the garden, when God formed Adam, he breathed into Adam. Adam becomes a living soul. When Adam gets the breath of God on the inside of him, he has the ability to make decisions. He has the ability to make choices. However, he chooses wrong and it gets him into trouble. And so God had to send Jesus. Jesus comes and he breathes on us. Now we are a life-giving spirit. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. We're not left out there. We have the life of God on the inside of us. And so Peter picks it up, who was one of the disciples, because Peter was one of, uh, yeah, the, one of the disciples of Jesus. And he says, he also, as lively stones, are built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. Just by that verse, you can see that this is not a fleshly operation. Come on. Serving Jesus is not fleshly. It's not soulful. Come on. We are spirit beings. Come on. I said we are spirit beings. We have the spirit of God and we are alive because our leader is alive. You are lively stones. Lively stones make a noise.
lively stones are being built up into a spiritual house. And then it says, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, that's speaking about Jesus, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So as living stones, we believe in Jesus. In other words, we are not disorientated, we are organized. Come on, we understand that we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are a spiritual house uh, and Jesus has put his spirit on the inside of us. Jesus is the head of the church. We are the body and wherever the head goes, the body goes. Whatever the, the, the head decides, the body does. That's how it works in my body. Okay. Then he says, unto you therefore which believe... He is precious, but, also, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the stone is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So what it says here, to those that do not know Jesus, he is a rock of offense. Is that right? We are built on the rock, but if you're outside of the kingdom, he is offending you. He's a rock of offense, simply put. But ye are a chosen generation. I love this this morning. Come on. We are, come on, let's read that together. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past, we were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. Hallelujah. What it simply means, there was a time where we were outside the commonwealth of Israel. There was a time that we were not part of the, we, in fact, if you're not Jewish, you were not part of God's chosen people. But how many know Jesus came, died on a cross, broke down the wall, the middle wall of petition, and he tore it apart so there's now neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither black nor white. There is neither male nor female. Come on, there's neither bond nor free. Hallelujah, if Jesus is Lord over your life, come on, you carry the life and the Spirit of God in you. And you are not known now by a group name as just the children of Israel or Jew or Greek. We are known as the church. That's the mystery that is being revealed. Hallelujah. I'm part of the church. And just reading those few verses, not to labor the point, note sentence and understand that we are handpicked by God. We are a chosen generation. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I believe angels would have loved to have lived in this dispensation. Other people would have loved to live, but now this age of the church, the age of the Holy Ghost. Notice the Bible says we are handpicked. We are God's precious private possession. Come on, we are set apart. We serve in a place of distinction. Oh, come on, we connected to the head. And so wherever Christ is seated, we are seated with him in heavenly places. So as the church, we're not just a little group of people down the road. No, we serve in a place of distinction. We are handpicked. We are God's special private possession. We belong to God. Come on, hallelujah. How many know suddenly everybody feels safe right now? Because everybody wants to belong. And so one of the most amazing things that God, he raised up the church where Jesus Christ is the head. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the foundation stone. In other words, if you understand anything about foundation, you have to build on a rock solid foundation. Then the cornerstone was also the stone that plumbed the building. Let me tell you, we walk in righteousness. We walk by faith. 
We don't walk by sight. We don't go after our feelings. We're not up today, down tomorrow. No, the church is a precious people that are established on the rock, Christ Jesus. In fact, in the Old Testament, when we talk about the church, and please, folks, this is not even touching the tip of the iceberg. God refers to the children of Israel then as my people. Come on, my people. <laughs> Hallelujah. If anybody talks about the people that's in this church, you should say, you mean my people. You mean God's people. <laughs> you see, you, you cannot refer to people by the color of their skin. You cannot refer to people by the nationalities. Now we understand that doesn't change the fact that you might be of a lighter complexion or a dark of complexion, or you might be from China, or you might be from Africa, but let me tell you, when you're in the kingdom, you're in the church. Come on, this will set you free right now. When you're in the kingdom, you're in the church, so you belong to God. In the old covenant, he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my not my hand. Everybody wants the hand. Give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. I'll take everything you can give me. <laughs> Humble yourself and pray. Seek my face. Turn from your wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin and I will heal the land. So God had a plan in the old covenant that you would come out of your son already, recognizing that you belong to him, and if you come to him and you seek him, come on, turn from your evil ways, he says, I will hear from heaven. Heaven will respond to the church. Come on. The church has forgiveness, come on, as a benefit of being part of the kingdom. And he will heal your land. Secondly, the church is built on the revelation of who Jesus is. So first of all, the church is called out of darkness, called out of sin, called out of an old lifestyle, called out of some uh, depravity. Uh, we were once sinners. We are no more sinners. We're not sinners saved by grace. We are Christians. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are blood-bought saints. But secondly, the church is built on the revelation of who Jesus is. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus was coming through Caesarea Philippi. And he came by, and many of you know this dialogue that Jesus had with the disciples. And he said, whom do men say that I am? And immediately they started answering, some say you're Elijah. Some say you this, and some say you that. In other words, everybody said what other people said. But understand that the church, you and I, the church, members of his body. Come on, understand what I'm saying? Just like members of my body, we are part of the body of Christ. Understand here that they said, some say Jesus, this is who you are. Some say you are Elijah. Some say, but the Bible says, Simon Peter got up and he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God. You are the anointed son of God. You carry the power to break bondages. Come on. You are the anointed son of God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed be thou, Simon, for Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And immediately Jesus said, Peter, thou shalt also be called Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. When you have a revelation of who Jesus is, no devil in hell can overpower you. You have to have a revelation of what Jesus has done on the cross of Calvary for you. Understand today in pulpits, not much has been preached about Jesus. Everything is motivation. 20 steps to go there and 20 steps to be lost. Sorry, 20 steps there. I understand that's all good. 
But let me tell you, if you don't have a revelation of Jesus, you are lost. If you have no revelation of Jesus, you've got no foundation. If you have no revelation of Jesus, the building is going to fall. So every man must have a personal revelation of who Jesus is. He's the rock of our salvation. He's the foundation of my faith. Everything of my life depends upon me. When I have a revelation of who He is, I realize the power of God that's on the inside of me. Hallelujah. Amen. Because as he is in this world, so are we. So if Jesus went about healing the sick, raising the dead, what's denying you of that power? Nothing. If Jesus went around doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil, what's denying you of doing that? You can do what the head says you can do. And so understand here, the opinions of men are invalid. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Let me lay just some emphatic points down here as I get through this. First of all, when he said, upon this rock of revelation, Peter, when you, when you understood who I am, recognize the church is firmly established. Say that with me. Say, the church. The family of God. The house of God. We are firmly established. I mean, you know, our lives are not built upon the sand. Our lives are built upon the rock, Christ Jesus. Come on, you see the rock all over. You see the rock following them in the wilderness. Out of the rock, water flowed. Water is the symbol of life. When Jesus was pierced on the cross with a spear on the side, blood and water flowed out of his side. I promise you, if you're established upon the rock, come on, you'll always have a life-giving stream that will flow right out of your spirit. Come on, there's nothing dry about being a Christian. There's nothing boring about being a Christian. There's nothing mundane about being a Christian. Come on, there's nothing boring. There's life that flows because I'm established. Hallelujah. I'm glad the river's part of the church. Folk, I want to say to you this. We should not take for granted what God is doing in this house. We should not take for granted the word that is preached from this platform. We should not take for granted the move of God that flows here time and time and time again every time we come into this house because there are some people that are still in bondage. There's some people that's still in Egypt. There's some people that in a dry atmosphere, there's no manifestation of the power of God. They just come into church and sing a song here and a song there, take up an offering as Pastor Rodney says. They go out as dead as they come in because they don't have a revelation of who Jesus is. But when you have a revelation of who Jesus is, Number one, you are firmly established. And just like water came out of the rock in the wilderness, just like water and blood flow from the side of Jesus, as the church emerged in great power, that's who we are. I said, that's who we are. Hallelujah. Somebody say a chosen generation. Say a royal priesthood. Say a holy nation. Say a peculiar people. No wonder the world does not understand us. No wonder they think we're mad. No wonder they think we lost our mind. That's right. We have lost our mind and we've got Jesus. We established on the rock. We've lost it, but we found him. <laughs> it's so difficult to preach this message, Pastor Alan. <laughs> because this starts to bubble right up in your spirit. And this is just not a little word. This is not just a little sermon. This is a revelation to your spirit. 
Because I understand Peter was, a doubt, uh, Peter was a guy that was not too sure and he had a split personality. He was like a reed. When the wind blew this way, Peter was like that. That was his old nature, Simon. In fact, Jesus only called him Simon once after that. He was a disciple when he found him sleeping. Called him by his old nature. Ha. When you're sleeping on the job, when you fail to, to wake yourself up, uh, shake yourself loose uh, and recognize uh, I'm firmly established. The devil is in hell is not going to talk me out of my blessing. He's not going to talk me out of my, come on, my promotion. He's not going to talk me out of the fire of God. Uh, I carry the fire of God on the inside of me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Jesus says to that person today, you are firmly established on the rock. You immovable, unshakable. The winds can come. The storms can come. The lies can be spoken. The economy might want to go down, but I am established on a rock. Christ Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. That, then he expands that and he says, you are Peter, the rock, and you established on that for revelation. And behold, I give you keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Bump your neighbor say there's no defeat in the gospel. I want to turn around and say there's no defeat in the gospel. In, in fact, let's just say it with some more faith. There's absolutely no feet, defeat in the gospel. Because not only are you built on a solid foundation, you have keys to unlock doors. You will never get to a door that will not be able to be opened if God gives you the key to that door. The key to prosperity is your faith to sow your seed. The key to your miracle is your faith to believe. The key, come on. I've given you the keys to the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth. Is bound in heaven. In other words, you know what the keys are? If anybody is unsaved, the key is preach salvation. God will lose that. If anybody is struggling in the area of drug addiction, minister deliverance. Come on. If anybody is sick in body, lay your hands upon them. Ah, uh, come on, because binding and loosing is not just No, no, no. Come on, get out there in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, devil. I take authority over you. I loose that demon spirit. I come against that thing. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Let me tell you, the church cannot be shaken. Cannot be shaken. Hebrews chapter 12, 27 says, everything around us that can be shaken will be shaken. Come on. It will be shaken. I mean, right now, our politics has been shaken. I mean, our nations have been shaken. But the church... <laughs> We are established on the rock, Christ Jesus. Come on, baby. <laughs> Devil, throw your best shot. <laughs> I'm rooted. I'm grounded. I have keys. Uh, hallelujah. I've got the key of David. All I do is gonna, I'm going to worship. And uh, listen, God says, I will open doors and nobody will shut it. And I'll shut doors and nobody will open. Let me tell you, understand the keys of the kingdom give you the options to walk in where the devil tries to stop you. Come on, give the Lord a praise for that. So as I said there in my notes, Jesus, the church belongs to Jesus. You know that everything else was created, but Jesus paid for the church with his own precious blood. In fact, I'll go as far as saying that Jesus, that was the only payment he made. He paid for the church. Because to redeem something, it's to buy it back. God put a price far above silver and gold 
on the value of every soul in this building. That's how important the church is to him. He paid with his precious blood. Now, the church is the centerpiece of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. It's the centerpiece of the kingdom of God. Aren't you excited for the river that's a local congregation? Part of the church, part of the kingdom. The Bible says in Psalm 68 verse 6 that uh, he puts the solitary in families. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Thirdly, quickly, the church has overcoming power. Say it with me. The church is overcoming power. You see, you cannot govern and subdue without keys. You cannot open and unlock without keys. And the Bible says that he said to Peter, I'll give you the church, the keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I will give you the ability. I will give you the, the unction literally to change the atmosphere that you find yourself in every time the devil tries to close the weather in on you. We have the power to change the atmosphere. You gotta believe it. You gotta believe it. Way back in the New Testament, they tried to throw them in prison, but when the church starts to pray, the balance of power has to move. They throw you in a prison, you start to worship, the foundations start to rattle. Doors start to open. Let me tell you, the church has overcoming power. There are three areas, over the world, over evil, and over all things. John 16, says, these things I've spoken unto you, that in me he might have peace. In the world he shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And if Jesus has overcome the world, you have overcoming power over every cosmos. You can move the balance of power. You can shift the power. You can say, devil, not on my watch. Come on, me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. Overcoming over the evil. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Ha. All we have to do as the church is present our bodies a living sacrifice. Show up. Show up at the prayer meeting. Show up at church. Give. Romans 12 says, present your body a living sacrifice. That is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world. The theories of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the church is overcoming power when they have a renewed mind by the word of God. And if it says it can't be done and you have a word on the matter, it can be done. That's really what it means. Overcoming power over the world. Right now, I don't know, Pastor Ronnie was talking to me on the phone and with all the hurricane and all that. And he said, man, I just prayed, it just moves. So I said, I was praying and I wanted to move it to you. He said, but then I'll move it somewhere else. He says, everybody's got to have faith for their own world. Yeah. How many know no hurricane's going to take this thing out? Uh, come on, no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. Come on, the church has overcoming power over the world, over the cosmos, over evil, and over everything. In 1 John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Come on, how many know the greater one dwells on the inside of you? Then the church has sustained prevailing power. The word prevail means an ongoing conquering spirit. When you sustain a note on the piano, it, it lingers on. This is what a sustain sounds like. You know, this is just playing it once. 
But if I sustain it, hey, in other words, it wasn't just a one off occurrence. Our leader is alive. And anything that is alive gives. Our God is alive. Understand, uh, the Bible says uh, that our leader is alive in victorious. Revelation 5 verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Don't cry. The lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. In other words, to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Understand, because Jesus is alive, every day there is a conquering power that is made available to us. How else do we prevail? We prevail by walking in forgiveness. Because the Bible says you cannot receive forgiveness unless you forgive those around you. Thirdly, we prevail by using the gifts that God has given us. The Bible says, and David prevailed over the Philistine. Whatever God has given you, use it. If you use it, you will prevail over the enemy. And he slew the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So because Jesus is alive, come on, we have sustained prevailing power. I mean, you know, he's not dead. When you call upon the name of the Lord, He's there. Come on. When you walk in forgiveness, when you walk in love, when you use the gifts that God has given you, and when you start to use the Word, the Bible says the Word will never return unto Him void, but it will accomplish. The Word is forever alive. It's a two-edged sword. Come on. That causes us to prevail. So the church is not just... An ordinary group of people. We have overcoming power and we constantly prevail against the enemy. The Bible says here and helps me understand that there's three ways that God builds the church. Revelationally, relationally, and generationally. It's interesting that when you have a revelation, you get built up. For instance, you don't prosper because I tell you to give. You prosper because you have a revelation. Come on. That the law of sowing and reaping works in the kingdom. So God builds his church through a revelation. So when he asks Peter, whom do men say that I am? Peter just doesn't dream up something. God drops something in his spirit. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. I want to say to you, whenever the devil tries to come against you, just press in. Just start to pray in the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you, sometimes we're going to have to learn through situation. But I believe God doesn't want you just to learn through situation. He wants you to learn by revelation. That you'll have a breakthrough. You don't have to go through the pain. If I can get the breakthrough on my knees, God will reveal, give a word. And when I have a word on the inside, it will be like an open door. Secondly, the church has been built up relationally. Talking about the marriage covenant. So the firstly, the word brings revelation. Secondly, our covenant with God brings Builds relationships. Wherefore they are no more two but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And this is sort of the hinge point of where I want to go for the next few minutes. You have a revelation of who Jesus is. Secondly, God wants you built into the family. For even as a husband and wife are in covenant, because covenant builds the relationship. Out of covenant, 
there's a spirit of unity. And the devil would want to use all sorts of things to pull you away from the church. He will use circumstances. He will use your situation that you find yourself in. And I'm too tired. I don't have enough money. This, that, and the other. But you have to be in covenant. For even as a husband and wife are in covenant, and when there's covenant, something is being built. When there's a covenant in between a husband and wife, the potential of a family can be built. When you're in covenant with the church and the brothers and sisters, that's how God builds the church. Hallelujah. 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 So when you don't show up on a Sunday, we miss you. It would be nice if you could make a call, if you could tell somebody. Why? Because we recognize that the enemy uses situations to take you away. And now you know when you're taken away, you're made vulnerable. You're made vulnerable. The enemy can come against you. So two things, first by revelation, then by relation, and then generationally. Look how he looks, uh, Psalm 127 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, so, so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an inheritance of the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are his children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quarter full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. First of all, God wants you to have a revelation, and that's how he builds the church. He wants you to be in a relationship. That's how he builds the church. And then he wants you to reproduce. How many know children speak of reproduction? And how many know when children are born, generations can kick in? Oh, come on. How many know the church has been here a long time before you came? Because somebody, come on, gave their heart to Jesus some years back in some of the generations and because of family and because of people getting saved and because of people getting healed and because of people getting discipled. Let me tell you, the church is an unshakable force. The church cannot be shaken because God is building the church by revelation through covenant and we win souls and we make disciples and we become a generationally minded people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are not here just for ourselves. We are here for our children and our children's children. Come on, is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Because as we are faithful, we are building a covenant relationship into the generations that come after us. I promise you, heaven and earth will pass away, but the church with the word of God will not pass away. Come on, give the Lord a praise for that. I want to close off by going to one of the thoughts here about the church being in the neighborhood, talking about the houses of joy. And if you read Acts chapter 2 from verse 42, you'll see how the church was established. The Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Now these are families. These are people that had a revelation of the Holy Ghost. These are people that were in covenant with one another. These are people that had children. The Bible says, If fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together, they had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church such that should be saved. Let me tell you, the church needs to get out into the neighborhood. That's what the houses of joy essentially is. 
where we study the word, where they fellowship together, where they broke together, not just people of the same uh, church, local church, meaning you reaching out to other people, telling other people about Jesus, winning your people through friendship evangelism. The Bible says they prayed, they gave liberally, no one lacked, and the Lord added to the church daily that to be saved. I want you to make a faith statement with me here today. Say, as we worship the Lord, in covenant with one another, as we have a revelation of who Jesus is, as we are generationally minded by leading others to Jesus, bringing our children to the kingdom, the church will spread into the neighborhood and we prophesy that in the city of Tampa, there will be houses of joy, houses of peace, houses of deliverance, houses of hope, houses with the anointing, houses of favor of God. I promise you it's not staying in the four walls, it's getting out there. I said it's getting out there. I want to close. Pastor Cross, you can come. In Acts chapter 12, and there's a reference right at the bottom of your page. The Bible says that Herod had been vexed against the church. Because I promise you, church, the devil won't like us. He knows that one of us can put a thousand to flight and two of us can put 10,000 to flight. He knows that the power of agreement amongst people that speak the same language that believe the same thing, that have faith, will move the balance of power. Evil people know. Evil people know. That's why there's so much upheaval in the government right now. Because every demonic force knows that there is a sleeping giant. There's a church that is praying. Come on. Come on. Don't tell me this is just because of other agendas. No. There is a church. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Right now the church might not have performed. They might not have done what they were supposed to do. But it's not about what we should have done. There's still a remnant. Come on. There's still a remnant. The kingdom of God starts small, but it enters, becomes big. We might look like a mustard seed right now and nobody knows about us. But we are the church that is growing. We're getting strong. We're getting into the community. Some, somebody hear me. I prophesy. We are able to move the balance of power. Herod was so vexed that he started killing off the disciples and it was Passover. Hallelujah. They put Peter in prison. You go read it for yourself. You see, God has always got an injunction against the plan of the devil. What the devil means for evil, God will turn it around for good. So they couldn't take Peter out because they were observant of the law and they had Passover. How many know Jesus is our Passover lamb? Come on. They were having the Passover feast, which is obviously representing the memory of coming out of Egypt. They put Peter in the prison. But the Bible says, go read it there in Acts chapter 12. They put him in prison. And verse 5, Peter there was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Herod had a plan to bind the church in chains. God had a plan of freedom to loose them on their knees. The church was praying. And look at the miracle. When a church prays, something happens. The balance of power moves. I promise you, if we would pray in every house, if we would pray across the city, if we would pray here in our war room, pray wherever we have the opportunity where we gather to pray, something is going to happen. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord showed up. 
You see, whenever the church gets together to pray, there'll be a supernatural visitation. Bump your neighbor and say, I'm expectant of a supernatural visitation. How many need a visitation from God right now? Then I encourage you as the church, start to pray like you've never before. Come on, just pray in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> we don't discuss the problem. We don't discuss the problem. The church prayed without ceasing. Ha ha ha. That's right. You see, the church was not in a building. They were in the houses. They were in the communities. And the news went out, Peter's in prison. And the church started to pray in the Holy Ghost. And the angel of the Lord showed up with a supernatural visitation. I prophesy to you, that's gonna happen in the next couple of days, that God's gonna show up. Come on by the power of His Spirit. Hallelujah. Because angels hearken to the voice of God's Word. Listen up. Not only did an angel show up, but the Bible says a light shone in the prison. There came a supernatural revelation. And a voice said, get up and led him out of the prison. When a church prays, you can expect supernatural visitation, supernatural revelation, and supernatural direction. You will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Come on, thank God for the church. Come on, thank God for the church. Thank God for the church. You're not alone today, people. But we're going to recruit many houses in the city. We're going to recruit many people that would lead and make themselves available. Because when the church starts to pray, like in Acts 12, the chains will fall off. The gates to the prison will open of its own accord. And you know, Herod thought that he had it all together. Did he? If I read the end of the chapter, the worms ate him up. Because nobody comes against the plan of God. When God wants to bring deliverance, He's going to bring you out with a mighty hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I don't care what your enemy does to you. God's going to take him out. Somebody say amen. amen. Say each one. Each one. Reach, one. Reach one. Each one. Each one. Teach one. Each one. Say make disciples. Make disciples. Multiply. Multiply. Win the lost at, at any cost. Say God is going to move by His power and by His Spirit in the neighborhood, in every house of joy. Much deliverance, supernatural vision, supernatural deliverance, supernatural guidance, supernatural victories are going to be experienced by the hand of the Lord in my very home. And Lord, I thank you for that. Now, come on, let's give the Lord a praise for that. Come on, how many believe it today? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, today you've come into this place and you've heard so much which we've spoken about this family of God called the church. And you say to me, Pastor Derek, I, I really am feeling I'm lost. I'm out there. I don't know. I would like to be part of this family. Yes, essentially, God wants you to be a part. 
He wants to call you out of darkness. He calls you out of whatever situation you find yourself into His marvelous light. He wants you to experience the joy that we are celebrating here today. He wants you to experience the peace that we have. And if you should die tonight, you will have the guarantee of being in the presence of the Lord. Today you have an opportunity to make that decision for Jesus. Today you have that opportunity to say, Listen, Lord, I want to be a part of the church. I want to receive Jesus as my personal Savior. Today, as you were preaching, Pastor Derek, and you've made Jesus real to me, I have a revelation that He is the Savior of my soul. I recognize that I've come to the end of myself and I want to surrender completely to Him. That's right, dear friend. You can give your life to Jesus. You can completely be sold out and put your hand in the hand of the Master. Put your life in the life of God. The Bible says you need to cast all your cares upon Him for He cares for you. I don't know who you are. You came into this place today. You, you came from somewhere where nobody knows. You, nobody might even know you. Nobody knows your name. But you came in you at the right place at the right time. You've just entered into an atmosphere of a people that know and have a revelation of who God is. That, that understand that Jesus is the head of the church. And you don't have to leave here lost. You don't have to leave here completely confused. But you can leave here in your sound mind. Second, you might have come into this place and you've gone cold and you've just kind of lost out and you've just taken your Christianity lightly and you've walked away from God and it seems like God is 10 trillion miles away. But today is the day of salvation. Today you can come and have a reassurance, rededicate your heart to the Lord and not allow the circumstances of life that might have come. The circumstances of life that has taken you away, that has discouraged you, uh, maybe through a divorce, maybe through a bereavement, maybe through some bad news, maybe through whatever. The good news is, God loves you. The good news is, Jesus died for you. The good news is, He's got a great plan for your life. You don't have to leave here in the same way you came. And lastly, you might have been around the church. You might have hung out and come in and out and for a long time and right now, you're just not so sure. You don't have an assurance of salvation, but I've come to let you know that God loves you. Got a great plan for your life and you can make absolutely sure today that before you leave this place, that Jesus is Lord over your life. Not only will He save you, He'll give you a reassurance of your salvation. And as you rededicate your life to Him, He'll be restored back to you as the backslider. And you can walk away from this place totally healed in your spirit, your soul, and your body. If you are any one of those three here today, and you came today into this building, I want to give you an opportunity. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And now you say, Pastor Dedek, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to rededicate my heart to Him. And I want an assurance of salvation. Then quickly, right now, raise your hand. One, two, three. Thank you. 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 Quickly put up your hand all over the place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over here, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wherever you are from, just raise your hand. That's right, thank you, thank you. Thank you over there, thank you over there. Thank you, ushers. Thank you, that's right, just put your hand up. That is your first step of faith. You're saying, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. In fact, over here, just look at me for a moment as we customarily do here. If you did not raise your hand on any one of those calls, if you did not raise in right now, quickly raise your hand and say, I need Jesus. God bless you over there over there in the pie section. If you did not raise your hand on any one of those trees, quickly raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Right here in the middle, if you did not raise your hand, God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Finally, over here and in the pie section, if you did not raise your hand on any one of those accounts, then quickly raise your hand and say, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want to rededicate my life to Him and I need assurance of salvation. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I want you to take the next step right now. <laughs> Not only do you raise your hand, 
but I want you to get up from wherever you're standing. Come on, get up in faith. Stand on your feet. Every one of you. Every one of you. Every one of you. Stand up on your feet. Wherever you are, I want you to step out to the closest aisle and come and stand with me right here. Come on, let's make some noise. Come, come to Jesus. Come today. Come today. That's right, you can come from everywhere. Come. Come on, come on. Wherever you are today, just pack them in. Everybody. Oh, That's right, you can come from wherever you are today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come, come from wherever you are. Oh, bless. Uh, come on, we're going to sing it one more time. I'm going to ask you to get out from wherever you see it. Come and join us in front. Uh, Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come and just worship the Lord with me, with me today. You know what I like about talking about the church? The church is literally like the embassy of heaven. You can come and we can find help here. Because we represent the kingdom of God. God sees those tears, ma'am. He's turning it all around. The struggle is over. A new beginning for you. Amen. New beginning for you. You receive it? For you and your family? That's right. A brand new beginning for you. Nobody will recognize you three months from now. Nobody will recognize you. Nobody will recognize you. Yeah. Change of heart, change of mind, change of attitude. Change of heart, change of mind, change of attitude. Change of heart, change of mind. Yes, God's doing it for you too. Come on, He's doing it for you too. All right? Change of heart, change of mind, change of attitude. Turn it completely around. Yeah, you do it all right. Come on. Bring you completely out. Is that right? Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just pray in the Holy Ghost. Hey, God's really touching some people here. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Doing it for you too. Just doing it for you too. All you have to do is surrender. Give him your heart. Give him your life. You're in a safe place. You're amongst your brothers and your sisters. Mm-hmm. You've been running so long from God. Is that right, sir? You've been running, but you see, there's no place to hide. There's no place to hide. The hound of heaven, the Holy Ghost, has been after you for a long time. And finally, God has literally got you. And today, come on, today is like the first day of your life. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout. I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I come to you today. I surrender my life completely. Lord, I turn from my old ways and I come to you. I confess with my mouth and I believe with my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And from this very moment, my sins are forgiven. I'm delivered from the plan of the enemy. And I have a brand new start from today. The old has passed away. 
and the new begins in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. I surrender completely in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer, that means you accepted Jesus, your Lord and Savior. We want to hear from you. Go to our website at revival.com and you can email us at prayer request. Tell us that you watch the YouTube channel. We really love to interact with you and send you something that's going to help you in your walk with Christ. And then, of course, you can continue to watch every service is taken and uploaded. Either we live on YouTube or you can watch it on a rerun as we edit the messages down. And I pray that this YouTube channel is a special blessing to you. I'd love to hear from you. I want to interact with you. You can follow me on Facebook, on my Twitter account, my Periscope account, Instagram, whatever. Uh, all the links are found on Revival.com, which is the best place to go. So let's just pray over you right now that the Lord would touch you and empower you and then become proactive in the kingdom that God use you in a powerful way to bring in the harvest of souls. And I pray for His anointing to touch you. Father, touch every one of our friends watching on YouTube. Raise them up to be mighty men and women of God and use them to impact their generation, we pray. Heal, restore, renew, revive them even now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you for watching. Keep watching and interact with us. We want to hear from you. We love you. If you'd like to be a part together with us, then support this ministry and so seed revival.com. There's a drop down box, online giving, or there's an address on the screen. You can send a love gift to our ministry. Help be a part together with us in the Great Awakening as we travel across America and around the world, lighting fires. So we'd love to hear from you and your financial support is greatly appreciated. From all of us here, we love you. Thank you for being a part.